Yeah. So I think this is where the kind of the risk to reward is, right? So at a federal level in the US, we don't really have like a regulatory kind of body that's saying what are the rules and regulations. I know the Congress had an AI summit last year and Elon Musk raised the bell in March. So we have like for certain industries like uh, in, uh, medical has HIPAA and you have the COPA for child protection and all that. Mm -hmm. But we don't have like a GDPR. The only one that's out there is the CCPA for California residents, right? Mm -hmm. And we need that because you can abuse and start using personal data and be able to kind of make it, uh, you know, not in the pro in what you the, in the spirit of what you're trying to do, because you can have breaches, you can have mm -hmm. disseminate that data to others, and then that you're like, for example, I'm going through a process of getting a bank loan. If the bank uses AI to, to determine if I should get a loan, that's fine. But if they're going to pass that data to other data processors and data collectors, and I start getting offers from other places, that's an abuse, right? So there right. needs to be boundaries. We need a regulation and there have been, you know, a lot of good work, right? So like the, uh, there's a, you know, partnership on AI where tech leaders are coming together, trying to create, you know, the old days when IEEE created standards, we need standards and regulation. If it, if we don't, we really don't understand the societal impacts when this kind of becomes kind of free will for do whatever you can with personal data. So I think regulatory is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I think we just need to kind of like GDPR has very strict rules. Uh, we need to make sure we have more, but don't restrict innovation d with regulation. And what, what are the things yeah. that came up yesterday at that IDC conference I was at was not only privacy issues, but legal. Yep. So if you are us, any of us, because we're IT vendors, mm -hmm. and we use AI to create code, AI has no way of knowing that Kristen's is patented, Demetrius has a service mark on it, Eric has a trademark on something. Um, there's all kinds of issues and lots and lots of concern. One of the things they pointed out from uh, an end user perspective is end users are expecting vendors to make sure they take care of that because the last yeah. thing they want is to use a pro get a product and start using it. Then there's a cease and desist or actually a lawsuit against vendor A by vendor B. They're using vendor A and then the product gets discontinued and they're actually using it and like it. But at the same time, vendor A illegally was leveraging IP from vendor B. So they were saying that there are several enterprises that have formed committees at the global fortune, let's say 2000, where they are actually demanding where AI is used that the vendor prove what they're doing, how they're doing it to make sure that they don't get stuck on their side if they buy a product from me and find out some of the IP even if it was advertently stolen from Demetrius, it doesn't matter. If it's stolen from Demetrius, <laughs> my company can't use it. And well, right. that they talked about a lot yeah. yesterday. That's the, I and see to say that's a big concern for us. I'm big on the open source side, right? And so we have to look at what's being put into the AI as data. Is that, again, proprietary? And then what's derived from the AI? Is the AI using and borrowing methods from proprietary code that might run afoul of open source licensing. Again, developers are using chat GPT left and right to go and build things. And again, where is it getting the suggestions from? What did, what was the origination of what was derived? Yeah, and I, I wanted to also go back and touch on something that Subo mentioned. He he mentioned CCPA and GDPR. Now, one, one thing that you have to realize is there's something called the Brussels effect. And so the EU passes regulation and that quickly spreads all around the world. And also lawmakers are also set in, in a few weeks around like April the 10th to approve rules under uh, GDPR designed to ease cross-border cooperation between national data protection authorities. And so that's going to be huge. And so are U.S. companies affected by the GDPR? Yes. Yep. U.S. companies are affected, and so that applies to any organization that operates in the EU or that collects or processes the personal data of EU citizens. So if you are a U.S.-based company, then you do have to also worry about GDPR. But what about backup data? So is backup data considered as part of an access request for GDPR? No, it's not. But your archive data is. So you need to really pay attention to those those little nuances 
uh, within things like GDPR as far as regulations are concerned. Yeah, and Demetrius, also just for ba- as both of us are in the backup business, right? Retention periods, right? Try to re- reduce right. those as much as pr- possible. Try to avoid you know, processing personal data. People use the whole best practice of privacy by design principles, right? So regulations helps us to know what's the you know slap on the hand. Please don't do that, right? So it allows right. us to give us guardrails, uh, but we have to kind of also be disciplined how we're building our products and processing our data. I agree. Do we there, think that's going to come more out of industry or government? Because I think we're going to have to put pressure down on various governments and regulatory bodies because nothing's happened yet, right? Well, we still don't have a privacy law in this country. Industry, right? yeah. Yeah. It, it, it takes time. It establish a lot yeah, of the best a lot practices. Of time. Yeah. Yeah, I think the key thing is if we take the responsibility and be responsible citizens to say we want to protect our customers' data, Mm -hmm. we're going to have to come up and have our standards like the POA I talked about, right? Those are all tech giants coming together and saying we need to have some guardrails. Mm -hmm. The government in trying to do that, as you know, takes time, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't want them to also stifle our innovation, but we need those guardrails. That's why I'm very pleased with GDPR. You know, it's a painful act to get to that certification. Chris said you probably have done it with your products. So, but it helps us understand and be sensitive, right? Mm-hmm. That we're kind of protecting. Because if, if the tech people don't recognize the danger and risks, we're not going to be cognizant of how to make sure we're designing products and managing products. Now, agreed. Government regulations always lags behind what we should be doing on the industry side anyway. And so I think it really is up to us right now to establish the best practices and come up with good uh, agreed upon conditions that hopefully will inform what the regulations will become down the road. Yeah, I think the key thing here is transparency. You got to be transparent about what tools you're using. And number two, right. you, have to, you have to get consent, right? If you, do, if you don't let them know what you're doing or get the consent, then, you know, it'll just cause a mistrust between the, your consumer and your, and your products. Mm-hmm. Those I think firms you're... that advise the end user side, mm-hmm. okay, not the ones that work with us as vendors, but the ones that they are telling all of their end users, particularly the global fortune 2000, you guys need to be all over your vendors. You need to investigate this because if, if what the vendor does impacts your stuff, you're still liable. And in fact, Air Canada lost a lawsuit as well as got uh, in trouble with the Canadian government last year because their AI chatbot was illegally advising customers and they were able to prove that the chatbot was putting them in more expensive seats, uh, messing up flight schedules, and it was all automated. And the Canadian court said, hey, you you own it. You're, you're Air Canada. You chose to use that technology. Yeah. It's your fault. Now, Wherever they got, the, let's assume that chatbot was a commercial chatbot versus an open source. So it's open source, it's all Air Canada's fault. But if it's not open source and it was from some vendor, some sort of uh, Gen AI from a, a vendor, then that vendor got, you know, Air Canada called them and said, you owe me a million dollars. I used your product and your product messed me up. I lost in court. It's your fault because I use your product underneath my product. So again, these product liability issues are huge when, you know, when the old Ford Pinto, well, I'm probably the only one old enough to remember the Ford Pinto, but when the Ford Pinto, <laughs> and, <laughs> and the Ford Pinto, you know, Ford knew about it, but the bushing they were using came from a vendor. When they lost those things in court, Ford turned around and went to the bushing guy and said, okay, we knew it, but you could have made a better bushing. It's partially your fault. We want some money. And guess what? The, those vendors, suppliers got stuck a lot of it was paid by Ford, but they also got stuck with it too. So that's going to happen with AI. It's just a product or an open source product in the minds of the court. And Air Canada has already lost last year. So there's already legal precedent, at least in North America, that on a product liability side and a legal side, that has nothing to do with GDPR. This is not a GDPR yeah. issue or a Cal- mm-hmm. I mean, California, California no. privacy issue. This was literally bad advice and people felt they were being defrauded by Air Canada and the Canadian court agreed and they had to pay all these people back and pay a fine. So that's going to happen to yeah. everybody else. And the courts are, uh, they pointed out yesterday, actually, that several governments are also looking at doing an audit like structure in addition to the regulatory, just like they do for corporate taxes or our own taxes, right? At least for those of us in the U S I know there's listeners who are not in the U S 
um, they could audit you for taxes here in the United States. And if you lose the audit, you got to pay money and fines. And they do it heavily in the corporate world. They're talking about having AI audits that are similar to the tax audits with the same sort of repercussions if the audit comes back negatively, a fine and all kinds of other stuff, independent of just mm-hmm. the, reg- the regulatory side. So this thing is going to become a huge whopper if people don't um, get this self-regulation happening now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes the government steps in to create laws like the CCPA and things because they perceive that we're not doing it for ourselves. Right. And, you know, as to Kristen's point earlier, if we're not regulating ourselves and to Eric's point, if we're not pushing on our vendors, uh, some helpful politician, perhaps with no IT knowledge at all, is going to do it for us. Right. It'd be a lot worse if they do it on their own. Trust me. Yes. Yeah. Um, GDPR has an interesting thing with AI, and then we'll get to the next topic. But, you know, under GDPR, you can request your records be removed from a company. But if those records were part of how an AI system was trained, you know, it's not as cut and dry as getting into chat GPT and removing a file like that data has become part of the AI systems training and you may not get it back out. Yeah, I think there's a, an opportunity there. There's going to be some interesting legal cases coming in the future where we're going to see people say, hey, was my data used as part of the training of the AI? Is the AI riffing off yeah. of stuff that was generated from my forum posts or my social media or my source code up on GitHub? It's We're in kind of uncharted waters here, so it's going to be interesting in the next few years to see how it plays out. Yeah. It's going to be hard to unwind, right? Because it is a continuous learning system and getting data from multiple sources if we're trying to now correct the action, you may not be able to get that data that's you're not supposed to, the PII stuff, it, because it's kind of embedded in an algorithm or heuristic or in an AI ML model, right? So that's the challenge we're facing. That's why kind of the garbage in, garbage out. Let's make sure we try to minimize the amount of privacy data use. That'll make sure that, you know, we kind of don't have these problems going forward. I think we're also going to have to combat a lot of uh, disinformation and misinformation. We already have heard everything about AI because people just don't understand what it is. It's a tool. Like we all understand it's a tool. It's just another way to do things, as I always say, very basic. But the problem becomes is when we're creating this type of self-regulation or regulations come through, the beauty of a regulation is common language, right? We can all talk about the same thing, same acronyms, same understanding. Mm -hmm. So I'm here for that moment more so than a lot of other things. But the other problem is what's going to happen when this becomes like a celebrity thing, right? They want to have certain things removed out of AI because it's painting them in a bad light. Or what happens if there's like some kind of uh, situation that we don't want people to hear about? There's a lot of control on knowledge lately and that kind of thing. Um, AI is going to be really crucial in that either way kind of movement. So how do we handle that disinformation, misinformation, not just about what AI is and what it does, but also about what it is doing um, in either one of our programs or different programs around the globe? And then how do you put privacy regulations and guardrails all over that? There's a lot of, it's just, a, it's a lot. If you get, start to go down this rabbit hole, you start to like, your head hurts a little bit because there's so much that could go wrong, but there's so much that can go right. So I want to make sure that the audience hears that we're not AI downers, we're actually all really excited about it, but there's right. so much that could go wrong with it that we're just nervous ultimately because yeah. we want to make sure that we all succeed in our own spaces, but also for the betterment of the communities that we serve. And that's something that I keep thinking about as we're all talking. I'm like, how are we supposed to serve our communities if we're going to be worried about X, Y, Z, and then somebody stole my stuff, you know, or mm-hmm. I, had a, I had somebody had their data taken or breaches or all these other things that fit in this yeah. category. That's really frustrating. Yeah, I think, uh, Chris, I think the key thing is not to stop the innovation and the power of AI. It's mm-hmm. like it's March Madness, Caitlin Clark season, right? <laughs> we want to play basketball. I want you to play ball, but we need some referees too, right? Just to make sure we follow the rules. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to throw in, throw in really quickly as well. And so what what I've seen, especially with the uh, Wall Street Journal, I, I read an article about AI talent being poached. So they're, they're actually approaching and they're stealing star AI entrepreneurs and technologists because there's a race right now to to get the best talent in order to help build out these generative AI systems. And so the giants 
may be hoping that the time uh, for these an antitrust actions are, are pursued, let alone resolved, they're, they're going to try to corner the AI market by gobbling up all of this talent. And so there was also something that was reported on Live Data Technologies, which is a research firm as well. Since the start of 2022, Alphabet, um, Amazon, Apple, Meta, and Microsoft, they've collectively hired about 30 AI experts from AI and Anthropic and Cohere, which is a Canadian model maker as well. So talent is, is, is a really big thing right now. And we're going to continue to see more the human angle of it uh, also uh, become a concern as well. Well, and those those big guys are buying up AI firms right and left at the IDC. Yeah. They put up a thing of those same big companies, including IBM, and they had a list under each one of every IA company yeah. they bought, independent of just stealing the best IA minds. They've had exactly. all these companies, and the other guys can't afford to buy them. So you have, no offense, you, you, you know, Skynet. You yeah. have the commercial equivalent of Skynet or iRobot. Well, iRobot was a commercial venture, not a government-oriented thing. So you have the government side, the old Skynet. You have the iRobot, the company mm -hmm. that was running it. And there, and, and God forbid, we haven't even talked about the impact of quantum quantum computing, which those of you who understand quantum know, can right. bring every single encryption code that is in the world right now. Forget all the low-end ones. Any high-end encryption used by the NSA or the Russian Secret Service or the Chinese... It can be, it can be undone almost instantaneously. So all the AI gen, everything that's done with AI, all the LLMs, when quantum starts coming out and IBM and Microsoft and some of the others are starting to have tests with real companies, you know, and that's going to change the, the ball game even more because the power of the mm -hmm. community side with quantum is so dramatically different than anything we've ever seen. Yeah, it's good. an AR arms race at the moment. And what's interesting is that yeah. I, you know, I'm a big open source believer. I think transparency is the model here. I think this is where companies, we need to step up, up our game and say, this is how we train. This is where the data comes from. These are the assumptions that are baked in. Any biases that are baked in, those should be disclosed. I think that's just going to be something important that us as companies and vendors need to start demanding of these AI companies going forward. And hopefully that becomes just the default standard.